Um, so I think it's very important to hold on to it all and let, let modern sensibilities come in. Governor. Yeah, this is a fabulous program tonight, by the way. And I'm wondering then, for the three of you, what is your next project, or what's the project you wish you had enough time to pursue? <laughs> I think Dr me? Drew has to really respond first. <laughs> 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 I'm a bad answerer of this question because I don't have a project right now that has to do with the National Archives and the past. I'm very preoccupied with the present. <laughs> and so, the future. And the future. Definitely the present and the future. And I think that by the time I finish my present task, I will have an idea for a next project. But I sent the manuscript for my most recent book off to the publisher two weeks before I was asked to be president of Harvard, so I didn't have a lot of time to <laughs> think up my next act. So let me turn it to my colleagues. David. Well, I'm, I'm a real liberal arts guy in the Harvard <laughs> vein there. That is, um, I get to indulge all my liberal arts interests. Um, and, and on my good days, I think I'm a Renaissance man, and on my bad days, I, I recognize I'm just a dilettante. <laughs> means I can follow my curiosities. So what I'm doing now isn't a, a, it is a historical project, but it's not a National Archives project, because um, it's a, um, I've given up on presidents, I guess. I did five, and that's a handful. I think I had the most interesting ones um, in my mind to do. Um, so I'm doing now, uh, I did a film about Napoleon after that, so I went on to Emperors. <laughs> but um, I'm doing a, a, a film now about uh, the Buddha. And so that means going to India and working with those resources. And how are they saving things? Uh, terrible. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, in pretty, but when it, you know, when it comes to the story of the Buddha, uh, he moves into legend almost immediately. And so the, there, there are no records. And, and for 500 years, they don't write anything down. It's all oral history. So you're, you're not doing it really in this. You're, you're not interested in the history so much as the historical context and the meaning of the story. So it's, it's a, um, as I say, I, I get to indulge different interests, and that's the one I'm indulging now. Uh, I'm just starting a book on presidential leadership in wartime, beginning with James Madison to the present. Uh, but could I, I make one other point? Certainly. We were talking about the reason you have to save everything. There was a letter, you know, public opinion mail, non-celebrity, that came to FDR, I think in 1940, from a Cuban. And the Cuban was asking uh, <laughs> FDR for $10, <laughs> send him a $10 bill. You know, it was filed. No one thought twice about it. Cuban was Fidel Castro. <laughs> and uh, and we, we have it actually in the public vaults. Absolutely. We have it on display in the public yeah. vaults. Um, I, I am uh, just in the middle of negotiating what I'm doing next, so it's not public. Um, but um, it will be uh, the next period. Officially, my last book ended with the inauguration of John Quincy Adams. It will be a family of women in the next period of history. Mm -hmm. We, we had no idea from what you were just saying a couple of minutes ago, uh, Koki. <laughs> Not that family. It's a, I know, but it's a, it's a problem of being so absorbed by what you're doing. It's great. Uh, I gather the Buddha left no recordings on how to become one with the universe. Uh, <laughs> my, my question is, on the LBJ tapes, I remember one of the first excerpts I heard was the period of 1964, and he was talking about... Greece and Turkey on Cyprus, and the name of the program by which he learned this was blacked out. And then there was a derogatory reference to some American official he regarded as a dilettante. And I'm, I personally am certain that this is the first President Bush, but whoever made the final edit on the tapes also blacked out the official's name. So I'm wondering who made these choices, and why on earth would the name of a program that revealed this information still be classified after four and a half decades? Uh, great question. Uh, it sure wasn't me who did it. Uh, <laughs> but this is something that has to do with classified documents that are open, and the same thing is true with tapes, and that is that it has to go through a process where if it's national security connected, like the one that you're talking about, has to be shown to the CIA, the State Department, all these other agencies that have people who look at these 
And I forget exactly the way the law is worded, but you know, they can delete references to certain things that would embarrass living people, things like medical and financial, things that would jeopardize the security of the United States now, such as a friendly government, things that would jeopardize you know, secret areas of our own government, presumably CIA, National Reconnaissance Office, and some th things like that. And sometimes it, it does go to an extreme. And as I think you got the idea, if you read between the lines, you can oftentimes pretty much figure out who it is. Um, the, the laws that were changed after the Nixon era to require uh, that the papers be in the public domain. And thank God. Um, do, are they retroactive to the presidents before? I wish they were, because, right. for instance, uh, the Warren Harding papers, after Harding died, Mrs. Harding took the papers to uh, Friendship, the house of her friend, Mrs. Evelyn McLean, and burned most of them. Uh, the Harding papers are just a few pieces of paper, and it was all perfectly legal. As late <laughs> as, as Richard Nixon, one of the reasons why Richard Nixon made those tapes was he figured that it would help to finance his life after he was president. He'd have all these tapes. Uh, he'd sell it to some rich ally, political ally of his who would then donate them to the Nixon Library, heavily censored, and many of them destroyed. And the same thing with his papers, along with large tax deductions. And again, he could legally go through his papers and take out anything that he felt would reflect badly on him. And so it was only because when Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon, Ford, who was a wonderful man in, in many ways, but he was not tough enough to demand of Nixon that these papers be impounded and protected from Nixon going in and ransacking them, Congress responded by passing a law that did impound Nixon's papers and tapes so that he could not get his hands on them, and also said that you know, in the future, no president will be able to do what presidents from Nixon backwards were able to do. And that's been pretty zealous. Uh, in 1993, when George Bush, the 40, 41, went back to Texas, and he, by the way, has been very good on openness and opening his papers as quickly as possible, some of his people said, uh, this law should not cover the hard drives, for instance, in West Wing computers. It's a fairly new technological advance. <laughs> they said, we understand why it should cover you know, official letters and things like this, but hard drives. And I think it went to court, and the ruling was that hard drives did have to be preserved. We understand that in 2009 a lot more than people did in 1993. Over here. Thank you. Um, Two-fold question might be controversial. Um, I'm pleased as punch to be able to even ask it. Um, should, are vice presidential papers um, archived? If they're not, why not? Uh, and your opinion on the matter? <laughs> Any of you, all of you? <laughs> well, yes, vice presidential papers are archived. Oh, okay. um, and Adrian will correct me if I'm wrong, but anything that is produced by a vice president and his people in the official course of business, paid for by all of us, has to be preserved in the same way as and when presidential did, papers. when did theirs start? Same time. Think presidential oh, Records Act, okay. same thing. Okay. Same, yeah, time. same period. And when do we get to read Mr. Cheney's papers? <laughs> <laughs> well. Is there a time frame? Is there a built-in? One of the first things that President Obama what? did was to sign, it was a I'm sorry. Five years total restriction. Oh, yeah, Say again. Do you hear that? After five years. Freedom of information requests. And, and all this but a pretty recent development because before a few decades ago, they could have been destroyed or kept closed forever. But you know, that, that sort of gets me to what you said at the beginning, David. You said, you know, this, this video archive is made available for free. And those of us who have put together films are used to having to pay mm. for footage. But of course, the point about the archives is these papers and these films and these recordings and these posters and these treaties and all of these, they're ours. They belong to us. Um, you know, this, this houses uh, America. Um, and um, it really is uh, a wonderful thing that, that we understand this, that we we, the people, are the people who own what's in here. 
It, it, you know, I, when I see the Declaration of Independence, I always have this, this, you know, this sense of awe. I still feel it. It, it feels it's like, it's like looking at my birth certificate. <laughs> but it's all of our birth certificates. And that, to me, is what the archives is about, this collective shared identity, uh, all these documents bearing witness to that. And, and there's something really wonderful about that. Sure. After having the benefit of seeing the papers of Justices Blackman and Marshall, the most recently retired Justice Souter has decided that they will not be available for 50 years. I'm wondering, A, what you think about that, B, why has Congress never gotten into the business of controlling it as it has on the executive side, and uh, any other thoughts you have in this area? Well, I would, you know, it took Watergate to make them control it for the presidency. And there is, there does remain uh, this question of the separation of powers. And um, uh, I suspect that if the Congress went after the court's papers, that the court would suddenly remi remind them uh, <laughs> of this document called the Constitution, um, but um, also housed here, thank goodness. Um, but um, uh, they are loath to jump in on uh, the, another branch's territory when, it, you know, when it's just going to get them in trouble. I suspect that were there some Supreme Court scandal of some kind, that you would see it happening. And I'm a little surprised that it didn't happen after Bush versus Gore. Uh, but um, I, you know, I would, what, what the court did therefore, though, and this is, you know, the court always does this. Uh, as a sort of self-correction of its own, because it knows that it doesn't have the, um, you know, the electoral uh, mandate. Uh, when they get into that kind of situation, they tend to reveal their own papers. Um, so that, for instance, Bush versus Gore was recorded. And, um, and they're doing more and more of that, by the way. Anything that they think um, is going to be highly controversial uh, there's much more recording of. Now, that's still very different from what they're saying in conference. Mm -hmm. no. There you rely, on, you rely completely on the law clerks to leak it to you. <laughs> and, and they never leak, of course. Anything <laughs> else? Would, Drew, would you like to just say something by way of, of summary um, of, of your work here? And I'll well, ask the others to do that as well. I'll I just want to say how struck I am by the changing landscape of research depending on which period you are doing the research in. And the 19th century has the challenge that things may be lost, things may have not been preserved, but that in a way is a blessing because it means that you can actually finish the research for a book <laughs> from time to time. I was just imagining how you must have felt with the 10,000 tapes and the, you know, here I am for however long. Um, in the 19th century, you're, you feel lucky when you find something, and it is a, usually a limited supply. I'm also struck, though, by uh, the challenge that you brought up at the beginning about what gets preserved, because we think everything will get preserved now, but sometimes technology will be the source of things disappearing. Right. How many of us can read the floppy disks that we created? Or the punch cards. Or the punch cards. <laughs> and so a lot of the technology, one of the challenges for archivists is that the technology has a kind of obsolescence. And we don't know how to preserve a lot of these materials. We're not certain whether they're going to persist or whether they're going to become unreadable or unretrievable. So we have so much information, but is it going to be available to the future? So the technology is changing very much the availability of, of things. And film, film will fade, film yeah. will crack, will it Yeah, be digital saved? stuff doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't last, doesn't last. So, so we you're going to have to figure all that yeah. out. <laughs> we have these possibilities of infinite amounts of information, and that's both good and bad, because it means the task of doing research is so great. But what will be preserved, or are we moving into technologies that will make a 19th century historian actually have a better um, array of options in terms of research than some people who would be working mm -hmm. on later periods? Um, let, let, let me look at it a, a, another way, which is um, what my job is, is to take these visual material and to shape it into some kind of a story um, that, that makes the 
it makes the history come alive and, and, and become vivid so that you don't feel like you're, you're learning the history. I think that's what happens with the visual record. You feel like you're experiencing it. You know, you can describe uh, Franklin Roosevelt's smile, but to see him flash hit, there's no real verbal equivalent. Well, one of the problems with this, you know, with, with all the information out there is that images can go dead on you. That is, I, I find it painful to watch the images of 9-11 over and over again, and just somebody talking. You know, the, you know, they want to talk about 9-11 on the news, and they just put the image up, and you talk. And you forget that there are people in that building. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, there were people in that building. And if, it, it's, it's my job when I tell us in historical stories to make you to remember that. Um, it's, it's kind of like the, the Sapruda footage, you know. I was of, just going to say, yeah. It's the same yeah. thing. You forget those are real people in that car. Somebody was really mm -hmm. shot. But you've seen it so much that the image uh, just becomes a, an image. And, uh, so, and we live in that kind of age where the image is, is, um, is, is, is cheapened, you know? Um, where where it, it, it's, it's, it's as if, you know, when we were kids, we, we had a game where you took a word like, say, snow. And you said it over and over and over again. And then suddenly, you'd for, it didn't seem to be cold and uh, <laughs> uh, you know flaky, and, 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 and it was just a syllable. And that's what that's what is happening to a lot of these images by their by the way in which they're being used and used and used. Um, that they're, they're no longer attached to reality. And as a storyteller who uses those images, that's a real challenge. And especially with technology like YouTube that just shows it over and over again, the Pruder film being maybe exhibit A. I guess you know, the, the final point I would make is that the founders did not imagine a national archives, and it's sort of amazing that they didn't because mm -hmm. one thing that they were very concerned about was that we might resemble the governments of Europe where they destroyed the paper trail that made the monarchs look bad. But one thing they felt very strongly about was that Unlike the governments in Europe, they wanted the United States to be, you know, they wanted all of us, our leaders and our citizens, to be all the time scrutinizing the way leaders and citizens in America behaved in the past. Where did they succeed? Where did they fail? And they knew that to do that, you need a documentary record. And that's what this is, and that's what the archives is devoted to. And anyone who impedes that, whether it's a presidential spouse who wants to destroy letters that make her husband look bad or you know someone in a bureaucracy somewhere who wants to destroy you know a category of documents that might show malfeasance uh, in their place you know they're stepping on that intention so you know since we are on the 75th anniversary i think the archives has had a very good record but it is all of our responsibility to hold the people who work there hold their feet to the fire well, and of course, they have an enormous job to do. No. I mean, how many how many records are we still trying to trying to catalog and all of that? I mean, how many billions? We're about nine billion. Nine billion. Nine billion. We should have a sign um, like McDonald's in front. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it is a huge task, and of course, there's never enough money, and never enough people, and never enough space, and and all of that, but uh, they do do a wonderful job, and it's making it more and more accessible. Of course, the internet making it more accessible, but also just for people to come in and find their family records, find the people who served in the army, find the ship your grandfather, your great-grandfather came over on, all of those things. It's remarkable how easy it has gotten to be to find that. But the other thing that I really, and, and when you say that you know you sort of get choked up, I get totally choked up. Um, this rotunda here, I always say, is the closest thing we have to a national shrine, uh, with the you know the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And you know, as a good Catholic girl, to me it looks just like an altar. You know, with Our Ladies all do the Bill of Rights, okay, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Saint Joseph. Was, was, the, wasn't by accident. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> St. Joseph, the Declaration of Independence, and then the main altar, the Constitution. And, um, and it is appropriately hushed, uh, like a national shrine should be, uh, partly because you know it's dark, and people tend to quiet down because it's dark. Um, but 
the one time that I was there that was even more significant than all the others was during a naturalization ceremony. And there are these murals up, up above of these, you know, white men in knee bridges and wigs and skirts, kind of. And, um, and down below on the floor were people from 39 nations of every imaginable shape and hue um, taking the oath and taking it in front of those uh, great documents and understanding, making a tremendous sacrifice in most of their lives to come here and, to, uh, and then to become citizens and, and feeling the promise uh, of the country and coming to this place uh, where the documents really uh, keep the promise alive in all kinds of ways um, to celebrate that. And it was really one of the most meaningful days of my life. And uh, I think that it really uh, exemplified what the archives is about in, ways that, uh, in a way that I could never have imagined. So I am very honored to have been on this panel with these three distinguished folk tonight. And thank all of you for coming and, and coming.